hello everybody this is the monthly meeting meeting number three of the visual groups at the visual tools group where a few tool creators in closure are collaborating and discussing possible composability and collaboration between the different tools and we will have a few updates today about different projects. Let us begin by introducing ourselves. Um, so uh, each one will tell another person to introduce, uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, Lucas, would you begin? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Lucas. Um, my main project is Omnitrace. It's a little tool that allows you to see what your program is actually doing and what functions call which function and so on. And uh, because I wanted to integrate it better with other tooling, I started helping out with Orchard and then helping out with Calva. And recently I got sponsored by uh, Closures Together uh, to, to try to extend Orchard to be able to work more on Closure Script. Um, yes. <laughs> and, um, but there hasn't happened very much this week with it. So yeah, there's no real updates. Um, Peter. Yes, yeah, I'm uh, uh, Peter. Um, also, sometimes people call me PES. And um, I benefit a lot from uh, help from Lucas lately with uh, putting uh, new pieces uh, in, into Calva, especially around um, how Calva interrupts or in, coexists with libraries and other tools. So this very, um, I think that's uh, the connection into this this group. Actually, it, it is uh, very much Lucas uh, when it comes to that. Calva is, of course, the this. Um, uh, yeah, a, a bit of a full blown ID for for Beast code for working with closure code and focusing up a lot on interactive programming. Yeah, because that's what I'm a big fan of. And should I pick Andrew? Hey, um, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm a data scientist uh, by 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 profession, day-to-day uh, -day basis. Uh, my kind of hobby project is uh, is a static website generator, which I mentioned earlier, called Fabricate. Um, I'm you know interested in how it fits into the to the broader landscape of visual tools that's emerging. Um, and yeah, I don't really have that much to don't, don't really have that much else to say. Um, uh, just that. Um, Glad to be here, and I'm, you know, I've, I've been very, very impressed with the um, rapid development of the visual and data science toolkit for closure in the past couple of years. Um, you know, as a data science practitioner myself, it's like been very encouraging to see, and you know, it's now reached a level where like I am comfortable doing a lot of my day-to-day -day work in closure, um, which was not true a few years ago. Um, so uh, I think it, you know it's. Conversations like this are, you know, an important part of like, you know, pushing that, pushing that forward. So yeah, glad to be here. Um, uh, I will call on Mauricio. Okay, so my name is Mauricio. I am working on Chlorine Clover, both plugins from Atom and VS Code. I also get lots of help from Peter from trying to find out the bizarre situation of the VFS code API and everything. And yeah, I'm here because my tooling also have visualizations and other like uh, custom elements that the user can interact. And I would be very glad if I could reuse some of the UIs from other toolings or consider that they are in ClojureScript or JavaScript. So yeah, they, this could be like very, very interesting for me. And, I mean, the idea of evaluating something and displaying in the way that you want, even if it's not textual representation. I may be able to do a video this week about a code that I did. It was a chessboard with this idea of like visually incrementing things to be 
Well, to show more what I mean with that. So stay tuned and I'm gonna, I don't know, name Pavel or Pavel. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, sorry. It's, uh, it's Pavel, yeah, it's, it's, you're very close. Um, I'll do the same thing I always do, which is kind of partly visual, partly spoken word kind of thing. So um, I help to um, organize this conference, um, help to maintain this project, uh, which is a bridge to welcome language. And, and the conference is, I don't know if you know the conference, but it's it's been a virtual conference for the last two years. And before that, there was a conference in London. Um, and I built this, which is um, a web app for research and different kinds of things. A lot of closure inspiration, small talk kind of inspirations and many, many other things. So I've been building that for, for some time. Um, and I'm just clearly interested in, um, in visual and interactive tools. So, um, uh, so it's kind of topic that's close to my heart overall. So that's me. Is uh, Daniel, David maybe, or oh, David is the last person I think apart from Daniel. So David, maybe I you can go. The last one. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, David Orm, hailing from Chicago in the United States. Um, I'm interested in visual tools largely well there's two levels one is what a lot of us have already said being able to visualize arbitrary data and have a way of doing that and secondly because i uh, in looking at a very macro level at what's happening in our industry i have come to the conclusion that web interfaces are extremely expensive to build compared to native user interfaces and Eclipse SWT is still the best way to build native interfaces across platforms. And I have a library uh, that I've been working on internally that does that, that exposes SWT in a very nice closure, closure-y way. And um, due to personal reasons, uh, chaos in my personal life, but things have, you know, some of you noticed I was cautious last time about saying when things might become available and I have personal reasons, things going on that I uh, have caused that. So, but that is still real and it's still uh, moving forward. Um, yeah. Anyone else have not, has not gone? Daniel. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Daniel. I have been involved in this tool called Node Space, which is one of those tools uh, that try to take a namespace and use it as a notebook. And we have been using it uh, for experiments and, and practice in the data science community. And now it is a little bit on hold. And what I mostly care about now is uh, figuring out a decent workflow with some of the actively developed tools such as Calva, Portal, and Clerk, and Oz maybe. And, and then Node Space might be useful later, but I think uh, today I'll try to kind of offer an idea of what I think the more pressing questions are. And those are the questions of compatibility between tools, which are kind, I kind of care about. Um, have we all talked? I think we have, right? Yeah, so uh, let us think about the plan. We have a little more than an hour till the official time. And then afterwards, some of us may keep chat. And uh, what we'll have is an update by Andrew about Fabricate, which is kind of a new or newish to most of us. And then I will update a little bit about compatibility experiments, about uh, kind of following up from the meeting we had in the middle of the month. And then we will have a chat about the state of VS Code tools, which are Clover and Calva, and both of them are here. And uh, if there is any other topic, then it is not too late to add that to the plan. And then we'll leave some time to 
discuss further anything we like, right? So, uh, Andrew, would you like to begin? Thanks. Yeah, sure thing. Um, do I have the ability to share my screen? Yeah. Okay, can you all can you all see okay? Is yeah. that wide enough? Um, sorry. Um, so yeah, so this this page that we're seeing right now, um, which uh, is a page on my website, is a page that's been generated by uh, Fabricate, a static website generator that I've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, it's different than other static website generators. Um, it doesn't it doesn't use Markdown or ASCII doc as like the primary input. Um, it's just plain text and closure expressions. Um, primary, the primary input is plain text. And then, uh, you know, closure expressions are embedded into the text using using this syntax that you see here. Um, you know, like the, the kind of primary inspiration for, uh, for, for for Fabricate is Pollen, which is um, a writing and publishing system for Racket, uh, dialect of, a dialect of Lisp, a descendant of Scheme. Um, and it was created by Matthew Butterick, uh, who is a programmer, typographer, and lawyer. Uh, and he built it to overcome the limitations of other digital publishing tools for Practical Typography, which is um, a great book that I recommend to anyone interested in you know, effective presentation, presentation of uh, textual information. Uh, especially on the web, um, and you know, uh, he, he in in the in the intro in the docs to it, you know, he he kind of talks about uh, pollen as embodying a point of view um, that you know, digital books should be better than other books, but they're not, uh, you know, and uh, we could make better digital books, you know, by exploiting the programmability of 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 uh, of, of that, and so. Those are the ideas, and that's like the kind of like context that I wanted to bring to closure because I think that you know uh, closure, you know, with its like huge ecosystem of like library libraries um, and tools, and being able to leverage you know the the the, the Java virtual machine as a platform, you know, uh, it means that means that we have the ability to do a lot of stuff that would be harder to do um, in a programming language like Racket uh, because like you know. Um, the, and the kind of like genesis of, um, of of fabricate is that you know I started writing a website in in uh, in pollen, um, but I wanted to use closure to create generative art for the website. Uh, and then I was facing the impedance mismatch between doing some stuff in closure and then copying it over into pollen. And I was just like, what? Well, why don't I just try to rewrite the website generation? code enclosure. And so I started trying to use some of the existing static website generators. And eventually I discovered that I had to basically rewrite the entire thing, um, you know, in order to suit the workflow that I, that I, that I, that I wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, uh, kind of like, um, like, uh, like what David Hanemeyer Hansen said about, about, about rails is that, you know, uh, you know, frameworks. You know, frameworks are not uh, frameworks are best extracted rather than envisioned. And so, you know, I didn't set out to create a new static website generator from scratch when I started writing the stuff. I, I extracted Fabricate from the code that I used to generate my own my own website. Um, you know, uh, I have my own criticisms of Markdown as an input format. Uh, they largely overlap with the arguments that Matthew Butterick makes about it, but um, I don't really think that that's that important. In general, because like I think like the problem with a lot of static website generators is is broader than that. You know, you 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 have like a simple design. It's oriented towards a specific use case. You have a bunch of markdown pages. You turn them into you know a tree. You generate an index for them, and then over time, you know, as more people want to do more different things um, with the static website generator, you start to add a bunch of configuration options and parameters and stuff like that. And then you have an Eden file or you have YAML front matter at the beginning of your markdown file. And then it just kind of, you know, accumulates complexity over time, but not in a, in a and, but, it, but not in a way that like the design is capable of. And so it just turns into like, you know, configuration soup, which is a tool that is not unique to static website generators. Um, you can see it with like lots of stuff that heavily uses uh, YAML for configuration purposes. Um, I, the worst offender, in my opinion, being like Kubernetes. 
Um, so, you know, uh, I'm repeating an old cliche, you know, that's common among, among our community, which is that, you know, any sufficiently advanced static website generator is an ad hoc unspecified error prone implementation of half of a graph database and query language. Um, and so like, I'm kind of taking that idea to heart um, with Fabricate. Um, so, you know, I, I, I tried to make the, um, the event model for Fabricate and how Fabricate reads and parses and evaluates the expressions and pages as extensible as possible by using a finite state machine to organize it. So if you want to add new operations to Fabricate, you just add stuff to the finite state machine, which is defined as an ordinary closure map. Um, and that's, and that's, and that's how it works. Um, so that's kind of like the, the overview in the background. Um, you know, I think it's probably more, a little bit more useful to, um, it's probably a little bit more useful to kind of see, see, see things in action. So, um, I'll just, uh, stop sharing my screen real quick, uh, but I'll open up Emacs side by side so that we can see kind of like the, the, the loop of how fabric, how, how fabricate, how fabricate operates. Wait one second. Okay, so so can you all can you all see see both Emacs and uh, and my uh, yeah. and my web browser simultaneously? Great. Um, so this is the source file that. So the, on the on the left you see you see you see the source source file. Uh, for fabricate, and on the on the right, you see the the page that the page that it generates. Um, similar to uh, both clerk and note space, um, the kind of primary organizing uh, concept for each individual page is a namespace. Each page each page in fabricate gets its own namespace, um, and that means that you know instead of having like stuff like YAML front matter uh, stuff, you could just you could just you know define a variable and use that as the metadata for, 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 for the post. So the title, we define the title, we define the page style, you know, so that you can use like a little bit of inline CSS to tailor your, your, your present, your presentation to, um, you, you tailor the visual style to the, the, the specific content on the page. Um, and, you know, now that we have metadata like that, we could use it right there in line in the document to do, you know, this is a, obviously a very basic, basic example, but, you know, the metadata var contains contains the title of this page, which is just fabricate, and it gets derived. Um, so this is an example form. Um, you know, we use a string formatter, generate generate a heading, um, and you know, kind of programmatically, you know, thereby programmatically create. Um, you know, H ordinary HTML HTML forms, and there, therefore allows us to do more to program the overall structure of the document than I think like the kind of traditional uh, markdown plus code block format does. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, this is the page that I've been working on, you know, thinking about how to document it, how to understand it. Um, so I'm just gonna, that um, you might have seen down in down in down in my REPL that there were there are a bunch of bunch of operations. So what's happening in the background here, right, is that like I have uh, a web server, a local web server running. Um, it's based on Aleph, uh, uh, like a it's like a just like a local basic static web server running locally to to visualize visualize the results. And then there's also uh, the file a file watcher watching the input directory and picking up changes to files and then re-rendering them. So you know when I when I when I when I save the buffer, um, you know the sentence that the sentence that that I just I just wrote you know gets gets picked up here. So you know each each page gets re-rendered in a loop that's defined by um, by the, the the finite the finite state finite state machine. Um, so you know it has it reads it in as a file. Um, it parses it using a, a grammar that I defined for these pages using instaparse. It evaluates the embedded ex expression um, and then it, it turns it into HTML output and then writes it um, 
So, you know, when, you know, using this, this combination, this combination, you know, having, having each page be a closure namespace allows us to do things like, um, you know, loop through all of the namespaces of fabricate and pull the doc strings out of them to like generate like our own, you know, uh, gen generate documents much, much in the way that like tools like uh, CLG doc, CL CLJ doc does, for example. Um, and, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to support, you know, arbitrary extensibility and the best way to get arbitrary extensibility is just to, you know, you bring the whole power of the programming language into the process of writing a document. Um, and that's, and that's what, what I think Fabricate brings to the table that, um, you know, is, is present, but not totally, you know, realized in other static website generate generation tools. You know, I just, I, I, don't, I don't know, like, um, you know, it, I always thought it was kind of weird that, right, that like, we have code in our, in our, in our, as, as, as input, right? Like if you have like a markdown block, for example, the, the code that is in that markdown block is maintained totally separately from like the, the, the code that exists elsewhere in the code base, right? Like it's not alive. You can't run tests against it necessarily, though. I think some people have, have developed tools that allow you to pull out, you know, stuff from your readme and turn it into, I think Sean Corfield has a tool like that that allows you to pull examples out of your readme and then run tests against them. But like, you know, like that, I just don't really see why that, that that should be, you know, we shouldn't have this like dead code over here in one part of our of our documentation and living code somewhere else. Like all of the code should be alive, um, and all of the code should be we, we should be able to run tests against it, you know, visualize it how we, how we want to and stuff like that. And that's that's the kind of like ethos and, and point of view that that I think Fabricate embodies. Um, but you know, it's it's still it's still very much like kind of in its in its early stages, uh, you know, I don't, I don't even have like a public release of this on Clojure's. It's up on GitHub. Um, I'll send a link to it. But you know, that's that's where I'm, where I'm coming from with uh, Fabricate. And yeah, I'm kind of happy to answer any additional questions you might have at this point. Uh, but I will stop sharing my screen. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this. So inspiring. Um, any questions to Andrew? about fabric not really a question i, I just want to say that um it's really cool that you're doing this because uh, i almost i almost um went to, to the dark side and almost learned racket instead of closure years and years ago and i was looking for lisp to learn and one of the reasons was because of because of pollen and uh, matthew butterick's work and and I don't know, I think they use it, do they use it for the documentation? Because they're like documentation of the Racket language looks like really good and um, I kind of always liked it. And and it would be nice to have something like that in, in Clojure, I think. Um, yeah. um, actually, if, I think the I think the causation is actually the other way. Um, oh, this, the scribble, right. scribble, scribble, yes, the documentation yes, yes, tool yes, for right. Racket existed before Pollen. And one of the reasons why Matthew Butterick chose Racket mm. to begin with was because Scribble was already this yeah. good foundation that he could build on right, for yes. the digital publishing tool that he wanted to write. Do you use this diamond? They they both use this diamond character, right? Like to sort of escape to code or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The the lozenge syntax oh, the is lozenge, like a little yeah, bit a little bit different. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in 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 um in pollen and like and like in Scribble than, mm -hmm. than what I have. Um, because like it's a it's racket you know has like um has like much more has much more robust support for uh for accessibility and, and domain yeah. specific languages than closure does like you know in ter just in terms of the design yeah. of the languages like racket was written to make reading like the reader as extensible as possible whereas like that was a that was a non-goal um as far as i understand it with closure i think rich hickey was like no if you if he he saw that like reader macros and common lists had like could sometimes become like really difficult to understand and did not yeah. and I think he did not want to make it as extensible so so there's there isn't as much flexibility in like the you know um the the way the way that um the way that you know like the input gets represent repre 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 represented in closure but that's fine I mean like I have uh you know like I I have like just a very simple insta parse grammar that um you know 
parses out the forms from the plain text and then kicks it over the closure reader. And like, I don't, I don't attempt to syntactically validate or anything like that. The, the, the forms, you know, like it's just, it's just plain text and a bunch of forms. And if it parses successfully, then it passes the, um, those forms to the, to the closure reader. And if there's an undefined var or like a misplaced parentheses or a missing quote, like then the closure reader will just, will just tell me about it. Um, actually, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so that, uh, you know, I'm trying to like strike an appropriate balance between the, the syntax for the page and just, you know, relying on what already exists in, in the closure reader, um, you know, so that I don't have to reinvent the wheel myself. So there is some, that's, that's like some sort of pre-processing step. That's what you're saying. Did you play around with the, um, because uh, you, you, you know, from, from the presentation, we know that you're an Emacs user. So have you, have you ever tried to play around with, um, org modes, org babble and sort of literate programming in org mode and. Yeah, yeah, I have. I mean, uh, mm. I, I, I think like I'm one of those Emacs users that like goes back attempts to use org mode every couple of years and fails like every single time um uh i just uh, i don't know i've i've tried to use like org roam in, in the past and like and like it's a cool tool but um i don't know like i for me personally i was more interested in a writing tool than like a note taking tool I, I think it's a different choice of emphasis primarily because like i think notes are mutable and writing is immutable like when you publish an essay, right? Like it's just published, right? Like, you know, it has a timestamp on it, you know? I mean, it could be revised, right? Mm. There are there, there are revisions, but like, really if, big, if, really if big we look discussion at like kind of like there. books and published documents, like they're more immutable, whereas like notes, mm. like especially digital notes are more mutable. And like, I don't know, I guess I kind of pers on a personal level, see the benefits of, see more benefit for me, you know, just improving my understanding by like writing immutable documents that reflect my point of view at a, particular point in time rather than trying to like keep everything up to date all the time um uh so i think that that's like one reason and also like that i i think that like org or org babel is, is a lot more and org mode is more, a lot more capable than markdown is and it has like a lot more structure to it than markdown does but it still has that you know total separation between you know code blocks and and non-code blocks like i can't use closure to insert a bunch of like, you know, org mode headings into like my document, uh, you know, and, and like derive the entire structure of my document programmatically. Um, and that's the more of what I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, I, 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 I have used and encountered the limits, you know, at least for my purposes of, of org mode in the past. Um, and I think that, that that experience has, has informed the design choices that exist within Fabricate. Cool. Thank you. Mm, I find your the, the, the interesting to see that you chose like the other way around to represent closure code in text form, right? Uh, the, all the new tooling, notebook, whatever things are like, okay, so we've got valid closure and now we need to get some text in there. And because closure strings are annoying to write over multiple lines and stuff, we're just gonna put it in comments or like some other way or we tell the compiler, please ignore this part. You'll do something special with it later, um, which helps that we can now like write clo uh, the clerk code in some editor that already understands my closure code. Uh, if I was to write uh, the F4, me and names, it's always good. Uh, but like if I was to write something in your library, I would have like the problem that the closure code I'm writing, I don't get any help with that if I need to like, not even like rainbow parents or anything. Um, and I'm probably never gonna close any parents uh, if the IDE doesn't do it for me. Um, uh, is there like a reason you chose to be like so text centric? Um, that that has to do with like, you know, like the context that this, this grew out of. Um, I was writing very long kind of like prose documents, you know, that like I wanted to intersperse some some kind of stuff with. So yeah, and I mean, and I, I totally I totally agree with you that like that is a flaw that like exists like within Fabricate right now. Like um, in the demo that I was just giving you, for example, right? Like uh, 
like Evax kept switching back to HTML mode. Like I had like a like a multi mode in uh, configured for Emacs that like would allow syntax highlighting and like all the you know closure tooling with CIDR and stuff like that inside of the the Fabricate blocks using the uh, using a, a library called Poly mode. But like that's just for Emacs, and that's just because I use Emacs, right? Like if 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 Fabricate is to be useful to other people who use other editors, that is a problem that's going to need to be solved. Um, it's not. It's not, it's not a, it's not, it's not, it's not uncharted territory for other editors by any means, because like the syntax that Fabricate uses is pretty similar to like ERB, like the Ruby, which I think is like the Ruby style um, templating expressions. So like other editors have the ability to do like context sensitive mode and syntax changes, but you know, like, I don't, I don't really know what the developer experience for using Fabricate is, you know, for like a VS code user or, you know, for a Vim user, like, so that would be that would be a problem that you know I would I would I would need to address if I wanted to make it as useful as it could be. I did something similar, albeit completely in Markdown, where um, my backend is Gatsby JS, and so all of my input is in in Markdown, but because Gatsby JS works very similar to what you're you're doing here where it's this javascripty thing that runs as a part of your build process that then generates a progressive web app that you can update wherever um i wound up writing uh the way i extended markdown was really literally the same way except i'm using instead of closure data structures strictly data I'm using function calls and so I'm parsing function calls out of the 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 markdown and um and I'm really curious about the directions in which you feel uh electronic documents can and documentation can be better I that's not a an avenue I explored much in my case what I needed was very much like what Edward Tufte's work is um not time to describe it if anyone doesn't know it go google him there's a a css library called tufty css that lets you write edward tufty style documents for the web and i i just wound up just using that and building on top of that and building closure code that would transform into tufty css elements inside of Markdown. There's actually a Markdown library that goes with Tufty CSS as well. Um, so all that to say, that's the limit of my exploration on that, on that axis, on that avenue of exploration. And I'm curious about what sorts of things you're seeing that I, uh, what are the dimensions of that problem that you're saying, I guess, is maybe a way of saying that I don't know enough even to ask the question properly. Um, so I can, I can, I can, I can kind of take a stab at, you know, uh, locating some of the context for this stuff. Right. So like, um, you know, I think that like tools for like creation, you know, like are, interactivity um is like uh you know is like a really important and you know indeed crucial part of the authoring process because you need you need feedback like inst as instantaneously as possible um when you're when you're creating something but when you're writing something and presenting something that like you know uh that like is designed to like give like an overview of a, of a topic or you know present some data you know in a in a coherent way for 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 an end for an end user like um interactivity can be um can be a bit um can be can be a bit unreliable uh because it's a new like the user has to accommodate themselves to like a new way of interact like navigating the document and like isn't necessarily familiar with like the grammar that you're using to like define the parameter space that you're trying to explore and stuff like that so like you know like one one of the core influences like on my kind of like point of view in terms of like what i'm trying to like present which is all influenced very much by by edward tuff's work was um brett victor's essay from 2006 uh magic ink information software and the user interface which is one of those pieces of writing that i reread every few years and I feel like I get something new out of every single time. And, you know, he says that like, if you're trying to, you should 
approach the primary the, the 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 design and presentation of you know te primarily textual information as mostly a graphic design problem and rely on interactivity as a last resort. So you know where I think like fabricate and and the point of view that it embodies fits into this ecosystem is that like you know like that it's 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 I hope it lets authors think more about like the the graphic design problem uh, you know of like presenting the information that they want to present and like you know use the benefit of closure code to come up with context sensitive ways of describing information that are never less static and non-interactive but suit their own use case um, and I still think that like that's like an important you know dimension to you know writing and and, and uh, digital writing that's like not you know that is is not as good as it could be um, and, I, and I think like part of the reason is is some of the limitations of the tools that we we've been using for a while um so yeah um i'm i i definitely am interested in the programmability of documents um as as an authoring tool um but not necessarily as much like have as much on 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 interactivity in the in the in the finalized output i mean that said nothing prevents you from embedding, you know, like a Vega light plot or whatever into a fabricate document. I've done that too. You can, you could use some of the visualization ecosystem that, that exists and you could put a little iframe in that has, you know, a uh, closure script and, 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 and have some interactivity that way. If you wanted to, it's, it's certainly possible. Uh, but like in terms of like the primary emphasis, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot on kind of, you know, static, presentation of information. Um, I rely a lot on SVG um, in some of my own work to like diagram things and like produce produce uh, documents that have like context sensitive, you know, topic specific diagrams, you know, uh, and I, you know, I think I just think that HTML is powerful. Uh, and, 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 and there's a lot of complexity and, and, and capabilities that are that are in HTML that are kind of ignored, you know, by by existing tools. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, what I wanted to do was put more ability to generate, you know, HTML, like, and use, use it to its fullest capabilities in the hands of the users of Fabricate. Cool. That makes sense. Thanks. Um, yeah. I like the idea of SVG too. I, I think that there's a lot of, I agree that there, there seems to be a lot of opportunity in that space. That is great. Um, any um, last short questions to Andrew or Andrew, any concluding remarks on this part? Um, no, uh, I just dropped the link to, to the GitHub repo um, in, in, the, in the chat. Um, the, despite being a tool for <laughs> writing, the documentation is woefully inadequate, but that's something that I definitely hope to work on um, in, the, in the near future. So. Yeah, uh, thanks for the chance to present it. Yeah, and we're hoping to see more in future meetings as, as much as you could. Um, I guess we'll now continue to the other topics. So I'll have a short update about compatibility experiments and then we'll focus mostly about on VS Code, I guess, on the remaining time. We have 35 minutes to the official time now. So I'll share the screen for a moment. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yep. Um, um, great. So uh, what you see now is uh, VS Code. And in a moment, we'll interact with it. Uh, I, personally, these days, I'm mostly switching between VS Code and Emacs for different reasons, not only closure. And here we are with VS Code. And what I thought, uh, we could do is kind of follow up on at least some of the compatibility questions between tools we discussed in the middle of the month. And anybody who has other aspects to discuss, please add to what I'm uh, discussing here. So I I'll try to kind of share the, the point of view of, of what a few of us are trying to do in the data science community. And it will be a bit sketchy, but but uh, I guess that's the idea to kind of uh, 
make it simple. So often what we do is explore something. Right? And what we are exploring, it could be some data set or some new function we're developing, some algorithm or anything, a library we are learning. So we're doing some exploration. And then uh, we, are, we want to be very playful and dynamic in that phase. But at some point, we want to document our exploration. And then we want to kind of create some narrative of what we just did, right? And then we want to share the document. And then we want others to pick that document that we have shared and use it on their own side so they could also explore and document and share and, and that could continue. Does it make sense, this kind of, of flow where we want to, to uh, kind of interchangeably be very dynamic and on the other side, very kind of uh, uh, um, careful about the storytelling? Is it OK? Um, any comments about, about uh, this kind of way of looking? Of, what we are trying to do. Um, yeah, so um, I think a few of the current tools try to approach this sharing and picking uh, question by saying, yeah, the format of what we are sharing would be a namespace. Code, right? Just closure code. Because it is kind of the common ground to what most tooling can handle. And we, we, we use that as a way of sharing what we have been doing. And also, maybe some HTML rendering uh, of, of the same narrative. So it, it is kind of uh, this double way of, of, of telling the story. One is the code, and another is, is the HTML. But the, the, that, is what, that is the way we are documenting, right? We're documenting as something which is a namespace and HTML. And then there is a question of how we document, what tool we could use to, to have this flow where a namespace can be used as, as a source for HTML. And then there are tools like Cause and Clerk and Notespace and others, right? And, and, and then how do we explore? So some people like to use OS and Claire and Notespace to explore, but it is, th there are things which are more dynamic like portal and, and reveal. And, and I think there are good reasons to use a few of these. And the hope is that we could have one flow where one could just write the same namespace or the same code and explore it with portal and reveal and then use maybe ours, maybe clerk to turn it into a document without having to bother about any details of, of, of formatting, of notation between the tools. And at the moment, it is just not the case yet because each of these tools has its own way of, of kind of specifying the details, saying this thing should be rendered as a Vega spec or as a Vega light spec or SVG or HTML or TCAP, whatever, right? All these formatting questions, they, the different tools have different ways to specify them. And um, is it making sense so, so far? Any questions, uh, any comments maybe? Yeah, so the hope is that we could possibly come up with one way of representing our code that could be shared across tools. And then people could be writing tutorials of the explorations and others would be able to pick those tutorials and explore further with their favorite tools. And that is what I'm trying to do. And my approach recently is to write tiny projects, really tiny projects, which are demonstrations of concepts. And the main goal is to get some feedback, to kind of see if we could agree on details. And we might not find it easy, but I think that is, to me, the most 
blocking short-term problem to solve, figuring out a way to document and explore in a unified way so that we could grow our collection of tutorials, etc. Et and it has been problematic for us. And so here is, you know, yet another experiment. And after this meeting, maybe in a day or two, I'll share the code after some polish. And uh, this, uh, this uh, project is called Portal Claire Kindly and Repel. But, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, I was hoping to kind of use all of these, Portal and Clerk, and kindly, which we'll mention in a moment, and, and kind of in harmony, but the clerk part is not working yet. So I'll just share the portal part. Uh, and REPL is this protocol where we can, um, at least in some tools, not all of them, we can uh, see the code evaluations and other events, uh, the interaction between our closure runtime and the tool uh, in some uh, protocol. And I, I guess uh, some of the other friends here will would comment more about NREPL. And I know Maurizio is very much, uh, cares very much about other alternatives. And uh, anyway, here I'm using NREPL in order to listen to interactions between the tool, the editor, VS Code with Calva, and the closure runtime. And kindly is uh, this tiny library we have been using to specify kinds of things, like say, this thing is of kind Vega, right? And here I just copied some part of it. So it is not actually using kindly. So uh, everything here is self-contained in really little piece of code, to just bring in some ideas. Clerk is this literate programming documentation tool and portal is this uh, tool for nav uh, navigation, data navigation, data exploration, data visualization. So let us just play with it for a moment. So here I, al I have already started portal and you see we can have portal running inside this code alongside our Calva experience. And then we could uh, evaluate some code. And what just happened was that uh, the little library, little ad hoc code that I wrote here was listening to the NREPL uh, protocol and figuring out, okay, we did evaluate this code and got this value back. So we could uh, show it on the portal tool. Uh, is it making sense? Uh, any comments about this? I guess it is kind of obvious and it is not the common way to use Portal, uh, I guess most people use Portal with the, the tap, the tap function. And I think since we are looking for a way to actually have the same code, the same code in our namespace and in our interaction with Portal, I wanted to avoid this need to write tap everywhere. So, right, so here I'm just listening and Kind of hiding this uh, uh, need to submit things to portal. And then uh, here is another piece of code. It is a delay. Daniel? So, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I have a question. When you evaluated uh, that form, uh, it entered into portal, but I didn't see it happen in the, uh, in the Calva oh. output rebel. Oh, here it is. Yeah, I just uh, it, it is there. Okay, so oh, yeah, yeah. Important. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's important, actually. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, yeah. Just the thinking. You you have found a way to like short circuit that. But okay, I see. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, right. So we can interact in the REPL too, and and that is uh, also recorded in in, uh, in portal. And yeah, thanks. Thank you for this. And so what happens when we have a delay? This thing where you know. This piece of code, if you evaluate it, it returns a delay value, which is not computing yet. It needs to be dereferenced to be computed. So here in my ad hoc definitions, I define it. So whenever we pass this thing to be visualized, we dereference. Uh, uh, so if I now evaluate this piece of code, then 
you see, we needed to wait for two seconds and we did get the return value here visualized. And I think this practice is quite useful because what you often wish to do is be able to evaluate your whole namespace quickly without waiting for slow things to compute. But sometimes you wish to explore some things and then you could use them this way. It is actually uh, kind of similar to the use of rich comment blocks, right? Where you kind of avoid evaluating it on the namespace evaluation, but it is a bit different. And yeah, maybe we shouldn't dive into it so much, but I just wanted to share this practice. Now, here is a, a, another piece of code. Um, so here we have these metadata attached to the code. And thanks to the uh, brilliant new additions to Calva, this now works and you can evaluate this piece of code. Thank you, Peter. And so this would specify that this kind of thing is of kind hiccup. So this code should be rendered as hiccup, right? And it works. And so you see, we did get this uh, hiccup rendered as HTML. And uh, last time we met in the middle of the month, Vlad commented that we might not want to do that. We might not want to rely on metadata on the code side, but rather on the return value side. And that is another uh, flavor of this. And you, you know, we're still exploring and I think we will need to kind of decide what we prefer and what, uh, and, and I'm so, so much looking forward to feedback. So here is another flavor of this where you see we, we are applying some function and this function, what it does, the consider function, it just takes the return value of this expression and attaches some metadata to it. And, and that works too, right? So these are two different ways. And maybe just another example with the uh, uh, Vega light plot. So this works too, right, uh, nicely. So, so we can kind of have this experience with portal where we have our code and we can pass it, we, we can just evaluate it and we get it visualized dynamically. Uh, another way of specifying the kind of thing could be a protocol. So there is this kindness protocol that just says any type that would like to implement this kindness protocol would just need to say what, what kind of thing it is. So here it is like a little boilerplate where we can pick uh, this, um, uh, we can define a new type of thing and say, yeah, this type of thing uh, should be rendered this way in portal. So, and the details are not so much important, but I think that the important thing is that we could dispatch on type and that matters. For example, imagine you have a buffered image, uh, this Java, uh, Java class, Java object that represents an image. So you would like it to just render as an image without bothering about anything. So sometimes it is useful to dispatch on type. And so here, this thing would be rendered as big, big text using this hiccup notation we defined. Anyway, these are just some thoughts about how we could interact with portal and about how we could specify kinds of things in a way which is tool agnostic. So the tool specific details needs to be kind of set up somewhere, but on the user side, we could just say, this is of kind hiccup without, without bothering about what tool we're using. Now, the hope is that without doing anything, without any, any other detail, I could just now ask to render exactly the same code in Clerk and get the document or maybe in OZ. So, you know, in OZ you could uh, also render a presentation with slides why wouldn't it be the same code? And it didn't work for me yet, but it should work. And anyway, that is where we are. And I hope to keep sharing small experiments this way. Um, so I'm not sure if we wish to continue so much with it now, but any feedback would be so much helpful. And I guess we could discuss just briefly now and then move to the other topic to 
actually discussing VS Code itself. Any thoughts, any questions? Quick question. Do we have a way of, of attaching more than one kind to a value? Oh, yeah. What do you think? Would it be useful? What, and what would it mean? I'm thinking of it as kind of analogous to how if you right click on a text file inside of the operating system, you get mul multiple choices of ways you could you could programs that could operate on that text file. And, and this is kind of analogous to that where we define maybe it's like whether it's maybe maybe attaching more than one kind to a data structure is the wrong thing, wrong level of abstraction, but um, that just that use case of if you have a thing, it might be, you might want to render it as Oz, you might want to render it as a table, you might want to render it as you know any number of different ways of things. And as I'm thinking out loud, maybe, like I said, maybe that's the wrong level of abstraction, but I would be curious about what this group thinks. No, I mean, the, the, the immediate thing that comes to mind for me, right, is that like, is that like if you have a numeric value, like, you know, is this a singular numeric value? Is this drawn from a distribution? Can you can you plot it, uh, plot the numeric value against the distribution that it's drawn from, or just plot it on its own? You know, like that that kind of that kind of thing has has kind of come up sometimes. Like, and I'm like thinking about the uh, the background of like certain problems that I've worked on at at, at work that I've used Clerk to visualize. Um, would be like you know it's, it's using using metadata um, to kind of preserve contextual information about the provenance of like uh values because they know that that was a that was a big theme I, it was it was like it was like the major theme of um uh Ger gerald sussman's uh, uh keynote uh at the last reclosure conference and so i kind of been thinking about that in the background ever since like in the context of tools like this yeah so just a short comment portal does support this idea where different kinds of viewers could be applied to the same value. And, and yeah, it's a question what what the namespace on the user side should be to express that. Yeah, I think um, there's a problem with uh, having multiple kinds on the same thing. Uh, if you want to solve your problem, Daniel, because like if I send it to portal, there should be one thing coming out probably. And yeah, cool, I can switch around in it, but whatever. But like, if you want to then like, just give somebody uh, the, that namespace and he should get the same result as you, you can't have multiple kinds of it because multiple kinds could print differently uh, all of a sudden. So you would kind of want to like somehow have a strong representation of it where it's like, okay, so this thing always prints like this, no matter where I send it, uh, right? because like that's the thing that you actually want to accomplish in the end. So even if you had multiple kinds on the same thing, you would now need a different concept where you can say, well, okay, it has these five kinds, but I would now want to choose one. Uh, so if I send this thing over, yeah, sure. These are the bajillion kinds, I don't care. I want you to represent it like this and every tool should respect like the thing I chose. Uh, otherwise you can't get the, same output uh, you had in multiple things, right? Um, and the other thing I was thinking about your problem is um, Clerk doesn't have like, even if you get the same namespace to run in Clerk, the way Clerk shows the data is just different than it would be shown in Portal. Um, yeah, sure, the bigger thing would look more or less the same, um, but if you said, well, I want to have a portal view with a table or whatever, this table thing now works differently in Clerk, uh, which is kind of problematic for you if you want the same output. Um, but after seeing the way you do it, I thought we could maybe uh, make portal um, work as a library as well. So portal currently like is has two parts like the part that runs in your runtime and the part that run that shows stuff uh we could pull the showing stuff in as a library as well and then be able to say okay cool you please don't display it just give me the html and now any function that calls that 
can either be passed to the portal thing that then displays that as HTML, which is fine, and because it would be the same thing as running it in the in the displaying thing. But that function, since it returns HTML, it would also render the same in Clerk because, well, for Clerk, it's just HTML. And I think Clerk can display HTML. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, so you would get the same outputs on both sides, and you could use the portal viewers that you've written in both tools, and you now wouldn't have to write two different viewers. Yeah, by the way, the other direction might be also to do the same thing in Clerk. Yeah. yeah, because the client side of Clerk is mm. already a library. So mm -hmm. it might be easier to begin with that. Yeah. That's true. There's a thing I'm confused about here. Um, kind seems like it, at the very least, rhymes with, uh, in a conceptual sense, with things like Molly and spec and schema. Um, what, what is the division of labor between, amongst these libraries? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there should be any relationship. Here, what we want to say is that this thing should be rendered this way. It is about how things should be rendered. And maybe we should use a different verb, not kind, but I'm not sure. But kind is such a wonderful word, in the way the vocabulary you built up there. I'm, I'm a big fan of kindness, like as a concept in, in life. So I, I love it. <laughs> so okay. maybe we should keep yeah, you, it. We should keep you, it for that. <laughs> you have the whole sort of lingo, like kindly consider this. And you can like <laughs> just just take away the most difficult things about naming stuff. You have the whole sort of idea, <laughs> of, you know, um, yeah. a, lo a lot of different ideas around that that you can use for naming stuff and, and actually works quite well. Yeah, there's, so, a, uh, there's a great line from um, the beginning of uh, Alan Kay's doctoral dissertation where he, he says that, you know, kindness needs to be an integral part of a communication system. Nice. Mm. Yeah, um, we have 11 minutes till the official time. How are we? Uh, do we like to make it longer a little bit because we want to discuss VS Code? How are we feeling about this time? Right now, I'm I, I can't go much it. longer, but uh, okay. So maybe we should have like last brief comments about that because we will come back to it on future meetings and then go about VS Code. Uh, any other comments? Uh, the thing I, I was... I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I can get this in real fast. The thing that I was observing is that when we talk about hiccup, what we're really talking about is a set of a set of things you can stick inside of closure data structures. In other words, it is a schema that we're imposing on closure data structures, and um, and that schema happens to also correlate one-to-one -one with HTML elements. So we're giving it a an interpretation. I'll stop there, give uh, Andrew a chance to jump in too. Yeah, I think mine overlaps too, because like, you know, like with, you know, I'm thinking, thinking about this in the terms of like, it also in terms of Fabricate because, you know, Fabricate, you know, creates like a big hiccup, you know, proto structure with a bunch of unevaluated closure forms in it and then evaluates them to produce a result, sometimes producing additional uh, hiccup data structures in the process, sometimes just producing, you know, singleton values or plain text or whatever. Um, and so like, I'm just like, kind of like thinking about this in broad terms as like, this idea of like, hiccup plus unevaluated forms, as like, a, another way of kind of communicating data between programs, in a way that's like, kind of tool agnostic, but still imposes enough structure for display purposes. Um, and so like, you know, if, if there's like a format like that, that, you know, that we eventually, that eventually gets con converged on, like, yeah, and, and, and some kind of way of denotating, like, you know, this is a form to be evaluated and displayed, like, you know, like I could fold those ideas into fabricate and make fabricate like a user of that, like, kind of like format, you know, rather than inventing my own, which is what I've done up until this point. Yeah, 
that would be great to discuss. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I guess we could continue this offline and we could now go about discussing VS Code and maybe make the session a bit longer. And so what do you think, uh, Maurizio and Peter, what would be useful to discuss now regarding the VS Code tools? Yeah, so I'm not sure. I haven't like prepared any anything. I just like think, think in the context of this visual tools and uh, uh, and uh, just the fact that both Mauricio and I are here, we, we can just we can just um, chat a bit uh, around uh, the the situation you have. In, in, v, in, in VS Code. So, so for instance, when I looked at, uh, at your, uh, uh, when you shared your screen there, Daniel, you can see that uh, uh, the Calva output uh, thing is just totally textual. And, and then you had, you can contrast that with, with, with what the portal had, which is, uh, uh, full, like very rich uh, display of, of data in any uh, any in any way, right? Be uh, I guess I don't know where the limits are. Uh, uh, so, Beast Code is very strong in that sense. I mean, since it can allow this um, web views, you can do anything inside in, inside the web view, but you can't like mix it. In uh, in the text in the text editor, uh, almost at all. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's there's an old issue I think from 2016 where someone like asks for a for a graphical widget that you can like show stuff in line uh, in 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 the text editor like like as a hover or something and you could use, so, that, so so that would be uh, I think that's far away to, to get to be uh, reality. So we have this, uh, that, that, that's uh, what we have like web view and that that is a full, it's the same thing as an editor. Like in, you can, wherever you can pl place an editor, you can place one of these web views. Uh, and I used to have uh, the Calva REPL output window as a web view before, uh, but I ran into into problems since I wanted it to be interactive as a prompt as well. So you could like, it was so editor-like, so the users expected it to work exactly as the, the VS Code editor. And after a while, I worked so hard to make them uh, uh, make my web view uh, answer to the expectation that it should be exactly like the V squared. After all, just like why why I'm doing this, so I just switched. So that is actually now just a regular editor. So um, I know that Mauricio has has taken another uh, uh, approach to it, but. It's that's partly because you have chosen that it it shouldn't it shouldn't be an input uh, source. You, you you visualize stuff there, and then it makes total sense with, with that kind of web view. Yeah, uh, I was also curious, Daniel, when you show that rich web view with the with the blobs and everything, how did you made that? Did you use an external library? Or it's just a hiccup. up. That is portal, right? Portal, right? Yeah. Yeah. So portal offers this. Um... It's just portal running as an extension inside VS Code. Right, but portal offers that like circles that you can or is it not. The graph, you mean? Yeah, the 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 graph call part. Does it support? Vega. Oh, that's bigger. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's bigger. Oh, I see. So that's one of the, the issues. I think I have the VS code opened here, the, the project. Yeah, I do. So maybe I can share my screen a little bit and 
Let's see what we mean. Okay, uh, how do I? Oh, interesting. Um, I have Zoom as a above all window, but the share screen is not. So that's why. <laughs> In the meantime, can I ask something, Daniel? Do you, um, because like with kindly, right? Um, just a really quick kind of question about this. You're using, you're using sort of metadata or annotations or, on on things, right? To, to communicate, to communicate essentially information to to whoever is going to display stuff. And uh, did you have any conversations out of out of curiosity with like um, with? Uh, with Chris Padachta uh, or anyone else, because it seems to me like uh, part of part of your goal would be just achieved by supporting this set of, and it, the, that library could be just super super small and could be just um, a spec for for those uh, annotations or whatever. Um, almost like we talked about, like at the very beginning, even before this, this was this visual tool on the last day of uh, reclosure. Um, on the you know data science special day, and I was I was mentioning um, anomalies, right? Which is just essentially a list of <laughs> a list of uh, namespace qualified keywords, right? And if you had that list of keywords that to support, you know, then maybe the first step would be ask um, you know a couple of people that are doing are doing are making the those tools to just to support support those annotations. And just translate them. And initially, there's there's not going to be that much consistency in terms of how it's going to look like or whatever. But it's going to work. It's going to show something. Yeah, portal does support metadata as a way of specifying the visual, as a way of specifying the viewer. And and I think that is useful. Uh, yeah, and and yeah, I think that is the challenge to kind of to be able to to collaborate. That's it. And yeah, so we should try. Okay, so let me let me just ask, are you seeing both screens, the Atom and the VS Code here? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I always ask these questions when I'm Linux because Zoom is weird. Okay. Uh, well, this this is the I think this is the, the gist of the problem. Like this element here that you see on the on the left side is something that I have full control with node and everything, but I can't draw things here in the side. I can only draw things with HTML and everything here. That's the web view that Peter was, was telling. And the trouble only begins here because this web view can't access the internet like you you can whitelist some, I think, paths that you can access, but you can't like whitelist everything and say, okay, you are a browser right now. And that's where things get complicated because I can send things statically here and get it rendered. So for example, I can, let me just see if I do have like, if I do have the task that I want. Clover. No, I don't have the task that I want. Okay. Let me just see if I already forgot how to do that or not. Oh, tag it literal. Just see if this works. Okay, so this works. So exactly the same as Daniel, I can evaluate um, hiccup data structures here. So for example, this works. Oh, I am not at all versed on VS Code, as you can see.
Okay, so this works. Um, if I just put rows here, maybe it would be better. Yeah, sure. So I can draw if I want with SVG or anything here, but well, it's tedious, right? I mean, I'm doing not, I don't want to draw everything that I want to draw by hand all the time. I could, if I had some, some way of like sending a blob of JavaScript, blah, 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 to the web view, but it just means that either needs to be a file, a single file or a bunch of files that the web view starts to, I don't know, take full control. So this have to be a bundle with Webpack or Browserify or whatever JS word uses now. And if I could send all this to the web view, then I could like, for example, support Viga and, and everything else as a tool. So I could get like 100% support for everything that JavaScript word offers. But I don't have this capability right now. I was trying to write a tooling from, for this. I could not finish yet. But anyway, that, that's the, the gist of things. Like It's not only that you can't render things inside the editor. It's also the web view, it's quite limited. Otherwise, I just like inject a script tag here and CSS file. And well, everything works as a browser, but no, it's not working like a browser. Also, so, it can't show video, I think. That's the, I don't know how, how much limit that is to us. But anyway, it is, uh, it is a web view, but it has like limitations like uh, that. It's very surprising. I say. Yeah, it's an well, offline web view. <laughs> Let's say something like this. In fact, I had to like got into huge trouble to make Hot Reload work from this web view. Uh, Marisa, dumb question, maybe, uh, probably. Uh, but what does Clover do that uh, Calva does not do? Oh, like, is I... there anything like in there that like we could put together? You know what I mean? Well, I think there are some some things. For example, this interactive view is one. Like I could render anything here mm. that Kava does not do. Uh, there's a whole config situation here. Like you can configure Clover with pure Clojure script, and it should hot reload. Shen told me that's not but it should hot reload everything. So for example, indent line is an, and everything should work. Oh, the, the way that we have to run this is so, it's so stupid. Like I have to run task clover and then do things. Oh, okay, I can do that. I don't know why, but anyway. Let me open a file, some file here. I don't know, something that I didn't change. Maybe this one. Okay, uh, something is not working anyway. Okay, so not try to, to debug what's happening. But anyway, it's okay. like the... So, uh, like... The, the, the two major things would be like the Clover REPL thing works just very differently from uh, the Calva REPL, right? Because Calva REPL is just texts uh, and just uh, throws out even representation of whatever uh, the, you ran. And you can actually do some visual stuff uh, in there and JavaScript stuff and whatever. And like, since Clover is in, written in ClojureScript, you're Working together with other closure codes is a bit easier than on the Calva side, where since like I built in stuff like, okay, I can now uh, extend Calva's tooltips and so on. And for you to the Clover, it would have been probably a lot easier uh, if I wanted to display something else in the Clover tooltips or whatever. Uh, 
Um, so, like, I'm like I'm imagining how we could like make either a Clover better or Calva better. In the end, it doesn't really matter. Just like make Visual Studio Code uh, better for like everyone who uses it in a closure space. Um, so if it would be possible to pull the Clover repo into Calva as well, where we could, you can then choose. Since like I never touch the, Clo the Calva repo as in I type in there. It just doesn't happen, right. right? I'm just like, okay, cool. This is my output now, uh, but I don't ever go in there. Um, so the Clover repo might be better for me. I don't know, maybe. Um, so it would be interesting if I could then choose to use this one as the output instead of the Calva repo. Um, if I have like yeah. anything to gain from it. Um, and the same with the config launcher script thing uh, that you have, where I'm currently trying to add this more or less into Calva. Um, but if we could use your version, I would save a lot of time and we could build some other cool stuff into Calva instead of repeating your work. Yeah, let, let's say I'm thinking here. Uh, honestly, it, it's also a fun story. I don't have an input here because originally this was going to be in VSCO and in the Atom editor, and it was quite hard to get the, the UI right. So I just like delayed. And when I added support for closure script, then the UI didn't make sense anymore because I was like, okay, so I'm evaluating this. Uh, what happens? Which repo do I send to? Because this is also something that Clover does differently from, I think, other plugins, not only Calva. Like this here, it's running on the on the closure script repo. And if I change for some closure, then it's running on the closure repo. So it detects the file that you are and evaluates the right. Oh. I hate yeah, but that, uh, that's in Clover as well. Uh, Calva, sorry. Uh, no, oh, that's in Calva. All the, uh, the, yeah, Calva also evaluates Clover script things in the Clojure script repo and the Calva th and the Clojure stuff oh, things in the Clojure repo. And if you've got a Clojure C file, you can choose in which one uh, it should evaluate. Oh, I see. And there's also one other thing that um, Clover does that's it somehow resolves promises. So this is, was an interesting like take. And it's cool. Yeah, I'm using the, I'm connecting directly to Shadow CLJS. So I kind of like handle into the tap of the Shadow CLJS and just use here. <laughs> so that's how I do the, the bi-directional thing. Mm. So because yeah, the- I don't know. Yeah, Peter, but I think that's interesting if we could like try to get that integrated somehow, maybe. This is yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> super, super, yeah. This is seriously cool Definitely. work. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. And well, anything that is inside the Clover, it's inside this tooling, the, the REPL tooling uh, library. So you may be able to just check the code that I did there and reuse it. I'm not sure how reusable it is outside of the closure of the outside of chlorine clover thing, because there's like some internal tooling, internal state being passed around. But maybe, I don't know, you send me a PR to separate things better and I just merge it and everything works. Yeah, I mean, that would be cool if we had like both sides use the thing because then we could if yeah. either of us helps improve it, those tools gain from it. I mean, that's the whole idea behind this whole group, I think. Uh, so that if anybody does any work, everybody benefits. Uh, so I think that would be cool if we could pull this in. It's a bit, it's a bit on like orchard approach mm -hmm. to it, it sounds, which, which is very pro proven at, the, um, at the, uh, making like a it could be a huge effort to make something possible and then all editors can uh, can benefit. So yeah, it would be super, uh, super nice to have uh, 
Yeah, sure. Let's let's discuss this because I I would love I would love also if you tell me how do I disable hovering things. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I hate this. I'm not really a VS Code user mostly because there's so much hovering thing happening that I keep I, clicking. I can, what, I can tell you what I do. I set the hover delay to one and a half seconds, and then then I just place the cursor beside the stuff. So then I can choose if I want to have hover because it just it just stay there a while. Oh, the, I see. The, the default one is I think it's three hundred milliseconds. So wherever you go, it just pops up uh, hovers, <laughs> crazy. But okay, <laughs> right. I would just have a very high resolution, so you the, the most of the stuff is not text, so you don't get any hovers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the um, I think. We'll, if we can like somehow separate the the work into things that are not dependent on internal state, this this should work. I mean, sure, repo tooling project is kind of big, but I think the that code removal from shadow will simply say, okay, I don't need like eight percent of the of the tooling, so the, your bundle will be small. I mean, I don't know. Do we even care about the size? It's not like it's gonna like you download it once and then it's running and in the end you might maybe download it again as an update or whatever but yeah, yeah. you download it vs code anyway if you download five or ten max more it doesn't really make a difference i think yeah i also don't think so calvary is already using shadow i mean that's a yeah. part of calvary's built with, with that tooling so it should be powerful is what should be possible for us to to use this via the names uh, the library so the namespaces you have provided uh, especially if, if it can be then as you say separated a bit uh, yeah. from uh, from the internal state i think they are for example the the console i am quite sure that it it's completely separate from anything else there's okay, nothing nice experiment, uh, Lucas. We can make. Yeah, it would be interesting. There are the, one of the problems is that there are so many interesting, cool things that we can do. <laughs> I don't know where to start, and I don't know where to find the time. But otherwise, uh, yeah, I, 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 I exactly know. I mean, so if sometimes uh, I I choose from that if I can make a small experiment for something that you know could be. If we could use uh, uh, Clover stuff in, in in Calva, that would be like so much leverage from that. So that's true. Yeah. That would be really cool. Maybe I'll show okay. something uh, if it is okay. good time. Um, I thought for a moment we could look into the Python experience with VS Code. There are a few visual things that the VS Code team added. And I think those things are Python specific. They didn't make it extensible, I think, but probably they hope to because there are other languages. Uh, so we could hope to it, for it to become extensible, but maybe just let us see how it behaves so that we could see what we could hope for, right? So, so, uh, Here, uh, what I have here is just a small Python file with a tutorial of this matplotlib library. And you see there is this, these marks where you could uh, mark uh, parts of your code as cells, as they call them. And th this thing is clickable and you could say, I wish to uh, um, run this cell or this one. Right, and you could also kind of evaluate with uh, uh, key bindings. And, and you see on the other side, on the right side, we have a web view and it could contain a visual output. This one is, yeah, it is a web view, and, but it is also interactive and you could type some code here. Um, so this does work uh, for Python this interactive view. Well, that is one flavor of kind of visual experience. And another one is um, editing a, a 
Jupyter uh, file uh, in the using the I think both ways both uh, visual ways here are using the Jupyter protocol, but this one is more similar to the what is usually considered the usual Jupyter notebook experience, where the actual file you're editing is composed of these cells, and you could evaluate one of them and get the visual output in the same in the same editor. Oh, what is that? Uh, oh, ah, unrelated. Some uh, zoom thing. Uh, oh yeah, so I should evaluate from scratch. So I'll, I'll evaluate this and this and this, and we do get the visual output in the editor in a sense. So just just like a little taste of what the Python people have in VS Code. And I'm not sure how difficult it is to have on another uh, language. I yeah, think uh, at least, uh, sorry, uh, you wanna go? Oh, sure. Uh, it's just that I did see this API it landed in VS Code after I did all the Clover, Clover stuff. And well, it will not work exactly that well for Clover because it somehow needs to get the, it has a structure. I mean, you can't just evaluate JavaScript. You have to evaluate like HTML plus something else or images you can't. I remember there were some like arbitrary limitations. I could not like simply say, okay, so this is a fragment of HTML plus CSS plus JavaScript, run this and everything will be good. It's as always as with all things VS Code, they, promise you 90% and offers you like 20 and you're like, oh, yeah. Maybe for other things can it can work on, you know, for static visualizations, but Clover also have this dynamic thing. You can evaluate something and get handlers to, when you click on the button, for example, it send something to the wrapper and back. So in a sense, you can do this, um, I don't know. You can even evaluate infinite uh, sequences in Clover and it will not blow your REPL in Clojure, not in Clojure script yet. So mm -hmm. the, the, the notebook, I think they call it notebook API, they do not support this, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, but I think like the, uh, the thing you shown initially, where they've got like the kind of interactive REPL thing on the right side, that should probably be possible, right? Mostly, I think uh, Peter's problem uh, with Calva uh, initially having the REPL as a web view was that now on the right side, you think you want to interact with like the other uh, things in line 13, 15, whatever. Um, and then you want to type in there, not just in the bottom, right? Um, and currently for you and the interactive one on the right side, you can only type in the bottom. You can't like interact with the, the other stuff. You can't just type in there or eval code in there. And in Clojure, you, we would kind of expect to, the, to be able to just go into the middle, type in some code or eval that code or whatever. And in Python, that doesn't really make any sense. So it's not that bad to not have it. Um, I mean, I thinking that most closure programmers don't really type into their REPL very much in their ID, but they kind of expect to be able to. So like just having the bottom part is, I mean, it's better than nothing, but um, it's not the experience that Kava wanted, I think, right? Um, yeah, so Kava's um, REPL web view used to be, that was just, that was just an editor full blown you can you can type mm. in the beginning and, and whatever so that that was uh, uh, the problem was user expectations when you had that mm. and then they they were working in a in an editor and they started wonder why doesn't it work why can i do this in this editor but not in this editor mm -hmm. and you know so it was just chasing the real editor experience and then then I decided that that wasn't worth it. So I switched mm. to the real editor experience. But then it gets to be text only. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think like tools like uh, uh, 
clover uh, and, and if we can somehow use that uh, you know have have uh, web user outputs and also portal uh, integrates very nicely and easily in, in, into this code mm. you can use it together with Calva. so, so I don't, i'm not sure how, how much we need uh, to do that in in, in Calva. i mean it's 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 uh, um, but I would certainly love to try to reach for 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 the uh, the clover uh, web view and see if we can put that into in, mm. into Calva. That that would be super nice. Uh, yeah, and I think if we had like pulled clover rebel thing in, you would have like literally ninety percent of your interactive thing. It's like the upper part, and then you just need the part to type into it, and just adding a. I don't, tiny, I don't think you tiny need text editor at the, the bottom. The repo. I, I mean, into the. I repo. don't think you need either, but like no, there are people who like the, typing in their repo. Never had read from from like Clover does it now. I, mean, mm. I think like Sean and, and and other Clover users actually see that as a as a as a plus. That's a good point. They have part mm. of of Clover <laughs> that that it, it just keeps you in. In, in your regular editor to do mm -hmm. the emulations and, and, and then the, the web view displays. Yeah, I think it would actually be good for big closure beginners because like I think currently they try typing in the REPL probably uh, if they don't get told not to do it. And then they write in there and then copy paste into their actual code and like as if that made any like and nobody who does it for a long time I think really types a lot into the REPL part. Maybe like I type in there like once every week or something because I want like some specific thing that I don't want to show up in my code for reasons. Uh, but usually I'm just back and typing it into the comment or so on. So I think it might actually be nice to not allow people to type into that document. So yeah. Yeah, we could, that we can consider as well. <laughs> you know, honestly, the one that helped me a lot with this was Sean Cornfield. <laughs> He just said for people, I love that Clover and Chlorine and everything does not allow people to type into the repo. And I was, okay, wonderful. So I'll keep this. <laughs> and I mean, there are probably people who like typing into the repo and I don't want to destroy their workflow. Uh, but if we pulled in Clover, we would still have like the output, uh, the calva.repl, whatever file, I can never remember the name. Um, so like the people can choose this one or this one, and if they like typing in it, they can always like type in it, and it works in there. We'll have to see like how many people then would still want to do it, and if we would still want to support it, uh, since the maintenance is pretty high with that thing, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. For me anyway, the reason why when I started, I always typed in the REPL was just discoverability of the interface. Um, you know, you, when I when I started working in Enclosure, Emacs was pretty much the only game in town. And I've been using Emacs since I was in middle school. So I won't say how long that ago that was. It was quite a while. And um, so the experience was like, OK, you have this REPL. You can type here. You can see answers. It's just, you know, automatic. It's fast. Um, and then you go to the CIDR web page and there's these pages and pages and pages of commands, keyboard commands. And, and it's like, well, how do I know what's more important than what? And unless you have somebody there at your, at your shoulder saying, no, don't do that, do this. Um, these commands are the most important ones you need to know, for example, um, then it's just the, the, the discoverability of that kind of way of interaction isn't high, especially coming from another language where that's not a thing you would even think of. Um, to, the, to Daniel's point, showing up the Py Python code, I noticed immediately how they have the, their, the little run annotations in line in the code, um, which is kind of exactly what it, what one might want to have in order to make that that interface really discoverable yeah that 
I think those are actually we two things that. that we can do in Calva, right? I think we yeah. can do the annotations. Um, yes. And the other thing is we've got uh, your two critiques on the the way, like closure interactivity works for beginners. Uh, there's the getting started REPL thing that it actually tells you which commands do which thing. And on the Calva side, there's uh, these are the 10 most important commands uh, things which are like, okay, so ignore like the bajillion things we have. These are the things you should actually learn. And once you're, you've got them, you can look at other stuff if you want to. So I think that helps a little bit at least. Yes, and I haven't been a beginner for a long time. So I'm glad. Um, to those, to the point, uh, Daniel, could you put that up again real fast? The, the Python stuff. So he's doing it. Oh, he's doing it. it I, gross, I, I caught him at a bad moment, <laughs> I guess. I think he froze. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. So the thought was what if we put something like that next to every top level form? Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. I think we could do that. Currently, I am yeah, displaying. It's a it's a code lens. It's called so we can do. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I know we've got it anyway since we're currently. Uh, I've got uh, how many references are there to this thing, uh, displayed from uh, Closure LSP, uh, but like we can put a pipe in there and say. It's... So it lets you map from like the the annotation, the code lens annotation to editor actions or like actions in like the output window. Yes. Um, so it seems like you could use metadata for that purpose, right? Like if you wanted to like have your own, like have a value display its own custom actions, right? You could annotate it with the right metadata and then use, and then like map the metadata value annotations to code lens actions so that specific values could have specific actions associated with them. Like for example, if you had like a simulation, you know, you could have like a rerun simulation button that would be context specific as opposed to just these kind of generic run, debug, go to type type things, which would be pretty interesting and pretty powerful. Yeah, it's not as super easy as you would think since uh, Calva runs in a different, runs in the VS code process and your code and your annotations would be in the REPL. So there's two different things and you would now need to run your dev or whatever to see what the metadata is and then ask the repo for it uh, as Calva. Uh, so Could you, you might open know... up like a connection though? Like if you have an NREPL yeah, server we've running, got, right? We've got the connection yeah. running, but yeah. like you, your function uh, definition might call a macro that formats your hard drive. So I don't want to just run your code <laughs> just yeah. to know the metadata on it. It's probably not going to format your code, but I, I don't know, maybe. Um, <laughs> so it's a little bit harder. It's not like impossible to solve. And that needs to be like some way to tell me, please don't run this thing because it's going to explode the world. Um, but it's probably possible to say, yeah, the code can choose what annotations are there. But even just the basic thing that you can say, well, okay, please run this top level form, which we've got a command for just displaying this uh, for people who are starting out, it's probably very helpful. Yeah, we can do that. By the way, we are around the two hour mark. Uh, yeah, so I, need to, I need to run actually. Yeah, uh, Peter, any concluding remark um, or anybody uh, would like to kind of conclude and say something? Uh, for the coming month or anything. I just want to say th thank you for uh, inviting me again. And uh, this was um, super fun to uh, to see what you had uh, to show. And, and it was extra fun to see the Clover stuff, <laughs> uh, really. So that, that was very inspiring. Uh, so I hope that I will be able to uh, make it to the next meeting uh, as well. And the visual tools uh, Slack channel, we can uh, uh, follow up if there is something I can do to ex experiment, someone will 
want to something to happen in, in Calva in some dev build or whatever. I can. Uh, uh, I, I can certainly spend some time. That would be fun. But I need uh, need uh, really to uh, to to run now. Um, yeah. So. Thank you so much, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank. Does anybody wish to conclude or say anything? Uh, any other topic you wish to kind of uh, suggest for the coming few weeks? Uh, something we should explore offline? Uh, something we should set a meeting about? If maybe through the month? Anything you think about? Well, um, honestly, I would like to see some more demos on on some of the visual tools here. I remember on my last um, meeting that I attended with you, there were people saying things like, oh, I want to make Clojure like a small talk experience when you just, I don't know, put things in the, in the interaction, <laughs> you interact with the code while you're running it. And that's kind of what I want Clover and Clarine to do. So I've been like thinking, oh, maybe, I don't know, I could somehow get some ideas from this project and everything. And I forgot to ask who was the, the group of people, who were the group of people that were trying to do this whole project. So I'm quite interested to see. Oh yeah, you were the one then. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we didn't get each other's contact information. So um... I'll, I'll drop my contact information in the chat. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, so yeah, because I've been trying to do almost the same thing in, in Chlorine. Well, in fact, Chlorine is trying to do lots of different things right now, mainly because it grew up to be something much more interesting that I was supposed to do in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it was like very, really cool experience. And I'm probably doing something stupid right now. I'm trying to do a revival of the Atom editor with some more modern architecture in Clojure Script. It might be something stupid to do. So I'm not sure if I'm going to continue doing that. It's just a lot of work. Uh, ever since Lighttable shut down, I've, I've, I've always hoped for a Clojure editor written in Clojure. Uh, you know, that's that just really feels like, you know, something like Emacs, but for closure would be, you know, the the, the ideal. Same. Yes, that's the that's the issue. I also thought the same thing, but doing an editor from scratch is just crazy work for now. So I decided to piggyback on Atom. So for example, I'm getting the components, trying to extract them in a way that makes sense and put something together that kind of resembles an editor but can be more configurable and don't have too many assumptions happening and in Clojure Script. And yeah, it's kind of working, kind of not with some bumps in the road, but it's almost happening. But I'm not sure if I'm going to continue because well, I have Clarine and I have Clover and I have work and I have a daughter. <laughs> it's just too much work. <laughs> so that same idea is on my roadmap. I don't know if I'll get, ever get to it for the same reasons, but my thinking was to approach it from Code Mirror 6, uh, building on top of the work that Next NextJournal has been doing. Um, they have a, a very good, but very basic uh, closure editor with all the things that you need to do basic closure editing already done. And it's a teeny tiny bit of code um, built on top of code mirror six. So, I don't know if that's yeah. interesting to you, but that was the thinking that I had. Yeah, it, it somehow is because <clears throat> I'm kind of doing over Monaco for now. I thought about code mirror, but I, I thought, oh, maybe Monaco would be a good choice. I'm not sure if it is, but the idea would be to make everything plugging. So you don't like Monaco, you just plug in Cloud Mirror, write a facade or something like this that 
adopts the API and everything works. It's almost the same idea that I had with Chlorine and Clover. They both use the same tooling that's completely editor independent. They just adopt some callbacks and everything works. And in fact, I was trying to target Cold Mirror in the past. I remember that I was going to name the project. I think it was Silver Chloride or something like this, but I never got time to, to make it work. And I also want to extract some parts of their pure node to be able to run asynchronous. So in that way, I could like get Code Mirror in a browser and somehow make the full contact. So like you, I'm not very uh, opinionated about exactly what editor platform I build on top of. Um, a, a thought I had about bootstrapping is if I can if I want, if I'm going for editing in place, then at the beginning, all you need is something that works and an end REPL connection. So if somebody wants to do something, some heavy lifting with their current editor, um, they can just jack in and they're, they're good to go. So, and then people will, I, my thinking, my hope is that people will get tired of having to jack in to do non-trivial work and start contributing to the editor experience and make eventually that will become viral but you know you never know till you try and i see people looking like maybe we're uh, i'm i'm feeling like maybe i'm losing part of our audience so maybe we should take this offline yeah maybe but it's also an interesting idea i mean <laughs> yeah i'm not like opinionated on what tooling to do to use i just want something that's more configurable than vs code same um, I dropped my email address in the chat. Yeah. So uh, does anybody wish to say anything, uh, any concluding remark, any hope for the coming weeks, anything that would be useful for you, any kind of meeting we should set or there were some thoughts about organizing uh, kind of study meetings about some of the technologies. And if there is any idea of that, we could uh, think about it offline, if you like, and organize something about any topic you would find useful. Um, Andrew, David? Um, uh, yeah, I, I like to just name like the, just the topic of, um, databases um so one of the things that i'm kind of like working on in terms of like very very sketchy experimental work is um parsing out all of the contents of fabricate pages after evaluation and putting them into asami uh the schema less graph database um and then using data log queries against that database as a writing tool um and so i'm thinking about you know in, in very broad terms uh nothing hardly anything is concrete but i do have some some kind of demos and concepts of that. Um, but thinking about how to implement more fabricates like data model and features in the context of database operations. Um, and just kind of generally thinking about how, you know, the uh, what, what, what I consider to be like one of closure, the closure community's like greatest strengths is like the, 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 the choice of these like data log based databases that we have uh, as uh, you know, and, and how, and how those might overlap with, you know, uh, the tools that we're trying to build. Because I think it could be like bi-directional, right? Like visual tools could be a way of exploring databases, uh, but also like a database can be a powerful backend for storing state and, and, and managing state with for these tools. Okay, can I share also something with you, Andrew? Uh, I am doing an experiment. In fact, I am also using it in Chlorine and Clover. That is a way to not get an API from the, the Chlorine and Clover, just query things with equal, so with Python. And it's been like an interesting thing. I mean, I, for example, supposing that I want to, I don't know, interact with some code in my, in my REPL. So I have like this, I don't know, a var, and I want to know what depends on that var or which dependencies that var have and want to instrument everything with something. This would be like lots of API calls and everything else. So I am experimenting if I could like do an equal query to get, okay, get me dependence of this var. And then another equal query or in the same equal query, like, okay, get me the form of this vars, the, the 
contents. And then I just change everything and revaluate with all the, with everything and it works. And in fact, I am kind of re rewriting parts of the chlorine code to reuse this because first it's faster, Python caches intermediate steps for me, so I don't have to do that. And second, if it's asynchronous, it doesn't matter. Python will like use us as if it's sync. So no more Promessa and, and, and other things in, in ClojureScript. And I think the most powerful part of everything is that everything gets customizable to the core. If I want to, I don't know, put a Clojure LSP in the, in the game, I just make a query in equal and it will query the repo or LSP depending on what's available or what's more, what it trusts more. You can also merge the results in a, in a way. So yeah, this this I think this is a great idea to to work around with. I did not use um, data log because I could not find a way to I don't know get this bidirectionality with data log. But yeah, equal is working fine also. So if yeah, you want how some. You, uh, how did you find the overhead of Python? Because like in an editor, if I'm saying, well, okay, so I need to hover over something that needs to return in like, I don't know, under a hundred milliseconds, right? Uh, so the user doesn't cry. Uh, the, and I don't know, I thought Python had a lot of overhead at least. Python 2 have a lot of overhead. 3 doesn't have so much, but it does have, it does have some overhead. The operation that I am migrating are quite heavy mm. on, on the repo. So they do interactions with the repo. So for me, it's not a problem. Like if Python gets, I don't know, uh, 15 milliseconds more of well, the repo interaction gets 100 milliseconds, so whatever. Mm. One of the things that I am trying to do is to cache some of the steps. So for example, in a way, sometimes I get the supposing, supposingly I want to autocomplete things and to get the documentation on everything, I have to make another repo interaction. If I could somehow cache everything and do just a batch of this, it will be faster. And Python does also support that. The problem, I want to get into a try catch and everything, and it's Clojure and Clojure script, Clojure script. The metadata is not that simple because, well, it's on the Clojure side sometimes. Yeah. But also, that, that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, I don't have to know, okay, which rep I want to use. I just query the path on and he said, okay, it's this. It tried Clojure, it didn't work, tried Clojure script, it didn't work, and okay, this is what you, you have. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, that sounds super, super interesting. Um, it sounds like it overlaps, but also departs from uh, a codec, like the, the Cognitech project that like loads an entire history of a closure Git project into Datomic and allows you to, uh, to query, it, query it using Datomic. Um, that's definitely like kind of been a conceptual point of reference for me as I'm thinking about some of these problems. Yeah, we've been doing uh, the, the Kodak thing at work. I wasn't super, deep into that part of the thing, but we are doing it to, to on Markdown stuff to keep history of Markdown documents and data log. Yeah, I mean, that's that's also one thing that I'm thinking about with databases of Fabricate is document history. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, seeing the diff of a document, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. There is a related project uh, called Literate by our friend Pedro. It is Another, oh, uh, thank you, Dave. Dave, would you like to say anything before you leave? Uh, so, sorry. Uh, no, just, it's, I've really enjoyed, the, these these meetings are among my, high, the highlights of my month. Just, I really appreciate everyone here and everyone's passion that you bring to the, the closure community and the work that you're doing in it. And um, uh, yeah, just thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. Hoping to meet soon. Um, Same. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, so, so yeah, just, just a short, yeah, take a, see you. Um, a short comment, Pedro did this uh, literate tool that I'm sharing now in the chat. And it is 
yet another literate programming tool so beautiful in the design so clean in in the way it is built and it is built on data script so all state transitions are transactions to data script and all interactions between the server and the client are transactions uh, in uh, written in data log and to me it was a really very nice way to learn about data script and one nice thing about it is that you can explore your data script state from within the notebook you're creating so it is kind of very it makes things very much visible so it is fun to play with and that's interesting because we're using actually a uh, data hike uh, with data script and I mean data hike is just the safe layer of uh, the data script uh, to do the codec stuff so you don't actually need to use datomic in there uh, you can use any data log thing you probably have to rewrite a bit of it but still Great. So maybe it is a good time to say goodbye to the recording, uh, unless there is any other comment. And yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this session. And I'll stop the recording now.